Awesome. Well, welcome everyone to the November edition of Vanbug. Um, before I forget, the next one's going to be on December the 12th, and that's going to be the end of the year. So there'll be some beer and good food after that. So please hang around after that as well and make some time in your schedule. Um, but today we're very glad to welcome Dr. Sam Aparicio, sitting right there. You can't see him. Um, and uh, our student talk will be given by um, Shams Boyan, who's um, a PhD student out in um, Dr. Paul Poplidis' lab at um, UBC MSL. Uh, so before I go about introducing Dr. Aparicio, I'm just going to get Shams to come down here and tell us about his research in 10 minutes or less. Hi, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Sean, so I'm from the Pavlidis lab, as you just heard, and uh, I study alternative splicing and how that impacts gene function. Today I'll be spe uh, speaking about a specific set of genes called the CACNA1 family or the CAF family, and they encode for voltage-gated calcium channels. Now, as the name implies, uh, voltage-gated calcium channels regulate the influx of calcium into the cell. This, you, see, you find voltage-gated calcium channels across different physiological systems, such as the nervous system or the cardiovascular system. And uh, this is pretty important because calcium is an important messenger ion um, that's needed in a lot of cell physiological functions. Um, now, the voltage-gated calcium channel uh, itself has uh, five or six, uh, five usually subunits. Uh, but the subunit I want to focus on today is that light blue one in the middle there forming the pore called the alpha-1 subunit. It's the pore forming unit that lets calcium actually travel into the cell. Now, what makes an alpha-1 subunit functional is the presence of four pore forming domains, which you have right here, one, two, three, four, and these four pore forming domains come together and they form a pore um, that calcium can travel through, which is what you see on this 3D representation of a calcium channel found in a bacterial, um, in a bacterial cell. Um, and without, a, without four pore forming domains, uh, these uh, calcium channels can't function properly and regulate the influx of calcium into the cell. Now, the CAV family uh, contains 10 genes, and any one of these genes can encode for an entire alpha-1 subunit. Um, so, for example, on the top here, we have CAV 3.2, or CACNA1H, some of you might know it as, and that encodes for the entire um, alpha-1 subunit. As you can see, there's still the four pore-forming domains. Uh, similarly, CAV 2.3, also known as CACNA1E, um, has encodes for the entire alpha-1 subunit and has four pore-forming domains. Now, given calcium's importance across different physiological systems, um, uh, as you can imagine, the aberration or dysregulation of any one of these genes in the CAF family uh, have been implicated in a number of disorders or diseases such as epilepsy. What makes, it, what makes a CAV gene more complicated to study, especially in the context of alternative splicing, is it undergoes, they undergo a lot of splicing. Each CAV gene is predicted to have hundreds, if not thousands, of splice isoforms. They are large genes. They have at least 36 exons, um, and um, each, um, combination, each combination of exons to form a specific splice isoform is hypothesized to play some sort of role in cell function, especially in regards to electrophysiology. However, a major challenge has been our inability to characterize the different splice isoforms found across the different CAV genes. Um, historically, we've used short read sequencing, Illumina-based ones, um, and as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, it's a little problematic for transcript quantification. Um, the fragments get, I mean, sorry, the strands get turned into fragments, and those fragments get sequenced. And then uh, we have probabilistic guesses of what the isoforms of, uh, of different genes are. And this is especially a problem when reads from short read sequencing map to exons that belong to multiple isoforms of the same gene. What's emerging as a novel technology that I'm getting a chance to play around with is um, long read sequencing. That, for example, ones that come from Oxford Nanopore's Minion sequencer. And um, how that works is you take the entire strand and you pull it through a pore, and that entire sequence, uh, that entire strand, 
gets sequenced. So uh, I applied my pipeline that I've been developing throughout my thesis called Shams Pipe, stands for Splicing in Human and Mammalian Species Pipeline, um, to uh, targeted transcriptomic data that our collaborators produced using the MinION sequencer. They, were, they targeted the transcriptomics for five uh, calf genes found in the rat thalamus, um, and they gave me over 17 million reads to play with. My first step was identifying the isoforms for each one of these genes. And once I established the splicing repertoire of each CAV gene, I annotated each isoform with protein domain information, again, to see if those four pore forming domains were present, conservation, and the isoform's expression. Afterwards, for each CAV gene, I produced a prioritized list of isoforms. At, when all was said and done, I had 3,354 isoforms across the five CAV genes. Now, uh, I have data for all five of the genes, but for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to focus on CAF 2.3, also known as cafna one e or the R-type channel. It's probably the least understood calcium channel. The knockout model for uh, cafna one e is probably creates the, uh, the mildest phenotype of any knockouts for the other calcium channels. However, gain-of-function mutations on cafna one e in humans have been associated with epileptic encephalopathy, macrocephaly, and dyskinesia, and there seems to be a tissue-specific expression pattern found with CAV 2.3. So in our data, we detected 2,110 isoforms for CAV 2.3. However, through our annotations of the protein domains, we saw that only 154 of these isoforms had the four pore-forming domains necessary for function. Uh, we also saw that CAV 2.3 had many appreciably expressed isoforms. So what I have on my, your left is, uh, on this figure along the x-axis is an isoform rank based on the isoform's abundance. So one represents the most abundantly expressed isoform, and 10 represents the 10th most abundantly expressed isoform. And then along the y-axis is the proportion of that isoform's expression relative to the gene's total expression. And as you can see, many of them, especially the first three, are similarly expressed. This was surprising to us. Uh, most genes look like what we have on the right here with CAF 3.2, where the most abundantly expressed isoform is significantly expressed, and the rest of the isoforms are not as expressed and extremely lowly expressed. So we wanted to dig into more. Uh, we wanted to dig into these CAF 2.3 isoforms. Um, and uh, for our wet lab collaborators to follow up on. Uh, I have an example of the three most abundantly expressed isoforms up here. Um, and you see the isoforms in their condensed forms because they're massive genes, as I mentioned, um, and the four voltage, I mean, the four pore forming domains. Um, and along the left-hand side of each isoform, you'll see the number of reads to represent the expression of the isoform. Um, and what we wanted to see was if the splicing differences between these isoforms were at all interesting biologically, and we turned to a conservation signal for that. So for example, the third most abundantly expressed isoform has a insertion of exon 19, and this insertion, this splicing event is conserved from humans all the way to bony fish such as fugu, um, whereas the second most abundantly expressed isoform deletes exon 10. Um, and while that's, that could be interesting, there doesn't seem to be a strong conservation signal for it. So it's not as high of a priority for our wet labs uh, colleagues to follow up on. So moving forward, uh, we're prepping a CAF 2.3 publication. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in taking long read data from uh, voltage gated calcium channel genes, as you can see here with CACNA 1C. And we're going to put out this splicing repertoire as, um, as a publication. We've also added a computational prioritization to each of these splice isoforms. Our collaborators, in the meantime, plan on taking some of the more interesting isoforms and looking at how they work in the context of epilepsy. And I'm also scaling up this prioritization to the entire human and mouse genome. So with that, I'd like to thank my lab, Paul, of course. Um, Owen and Jordan, I didn't get a chance to show some of their, the work they've been doing for me, but they've been quite helpful. And of course, our collaborators for the data, uh, Terry Snutch and John Tyson, along with the usual funding opportunity. Um, thank you. Yeah. Really pressing question. 
Great. Well, come and find him over pizza after. Okay. Cool. Then. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Great. So um, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Sam Aparicio amongst us today. Um, Dr. Aparicio is the head of the Department of Molecular Oncology and Breast um, at the BC Cancer Agency. He's also, he, you hold a fellowship chair or something something in molecular oncology in BC as well. He'll tell you more about that, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, Dr. Aparicio originally did his PhD with um, Dr. Sidney Brenner in Cambridge, then hung around in Cambridge for a few more years in senior re leadership roles in research. He then moved to Vancouver in 2005, um, and he's been here with us since then, um, leading a lot of innovative research in breast cancers, ovarian cancers, um, deconvolving the evolutionary patterns of various tumors. So without much further explanations, um, Dr. Aparicio. I'm going to pull up your slides as well. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, view. Screen. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, I was excited to hear mention of the food because that's what I did my PhD on. Um, okay, so I thought what I would do is... Um, try and give you some kind of a flavor for one of the corners of research that we're working in, which is this connection between um, measurements we're making mostly uh, now in the single cell space. Um, just maybe um, hint at some of the um, mathematics and statistics that we are using there. And I also talk about, uh, it'll be connected with model systems. And <clears throat> essentially, the, you know, one of the key problems that we're trying to solve is um, going to be illustrated shortly, and it has to do with dynamics of cancer. And I, before I go there, I just want to say that um, I, I do have um, extraordinary um, collaborators in in statistics and computer science. We um, locally work very closely with Alex Bouchard, who is a faculty member of statistics. Uh, my colleague Sarah Bouchard, with whom I continue to do a lot of work, um, has translocated to uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. You know, we're we're using the cloud and airplanes to keep the work going um, and Andy Roth has just joined us as a faculty member and we now uh, it's not announced yet but we have a new faculty member uh, who's just joining us from MIT um, computer science who works in uh, the area of um, causal logic and, and statistics and so we're we're working on um, diverse problems uh, today I think it's really going to be mostly about uh, clonal evolution and cancer that's a problem we've been studying for a while um, I've also been working, uh, trying to resolve the problem of the variation between patients in, that have breast cancers and other cancers using genomics. Um, we have worked uh, in the area of chemical biology of splicing. We've um, recently published quite a lot of small molecule inhibitors in that space. And then, of course, there are computational methods that have been, uh, whose genesis lies in the problems that we're trying to solve. And that, this is kind of uh, universe we're in. I thought what I would begin, because I, I appreciate that some of you in the audience may be non-cancer non or not thinking about cancer, is just say that our work is really found, founded in our ability to measure genomes, transcriptomes, and proteomes. And so it's worth just standing back. We're about 10 years from a big, huge technology inflection point that happened uh, around 2008-2009, which is that the capacity for sequencing DNA took a several log orders jump. Uh, and this was due to the shift from essentially electrophoresis-based sequencing to image-based sequencing. And as we now know, there are a number of technologies for doing this that have different characteristics. Um, but short read sequencing has changed our understanding of cancer. And it's, it's actually not such a long interval. Somebody was asking earlier, you know, how long does it take before discoveries get into practice? Um, there are really three things that I think the last decade has taught us about cancer that we perhaps didn't know. The first is summarized on this slide, and I can't really do justice to the world literature in just one slide, but it's meant to indicate that we learned about many new, completely, completely new classes of cancer-causing genes. That is to say, at the time that all this was started, uh, at sort of at scale around 2008 uh, or so, 2009, we knew about signaling proteins. We knew about oncogenes that came from viral pathogenesis. We, there were quite a lot of oncogenes and tumor suppressors that were known. And there was a kind of sense that maybe everything had been mapped. But the big 
I think one of the big denouements of sequencing was that we discovered, uh, the field as a whole discovered, uh, that there are many more different classes of gene involved. And uh, there is a now famous um, cartoon in a review. If you only ever want to read one thing about cancer, you should read this paper called The Hallmarks of Cancer, The Next Generation, which is opinionated. It doesn't really contain all of cancer biology, but it does, it does relate something about the what are the molecular mechanisms by which cells turn malignant. And there have been many of these. The, this um, circle has 10 mechanisms, and there are many others that have been since discovered. But what's, what's remarkable is that the sequencing really told us that in just about every one of these classes of mechanism, new genes were found in new classes of protein that were not previously suspected. And the translational impact of that has been that in that remarkably short space of time, there are now both diagnostics that are in use and also drugs that are being used in patients that are targeted towards some of these mutations. And the development has been that rapid. So there has been an impact from all of the sequencing and gene discovery. Uh, and I, I say that maybe it's redundant for some of the audience, but I think it's worth understanding. The other major impact the second thing that really came from a lot of genome sequencing is that because we can study variation in the genome systematically, we're able to look at uh, patterns of mutation. And of course, in uh, the context of organismal evolution, looking at patterns of um, sequence evolution has taught us a lot about proteins and the way that protein structure changes over evolutionary time. In the context of cancer, because a lot of cancer is predicated on ge genomic instability and mutation, we've learned that we can recognize certain mechanisms that cause mutagenesis either through exogenous chemicals, our environment, which may uh, mutate the genome. Our genomes are a sensor of, of our history, uh, but also endogenous mechanisms that arise from genetic, um, genetically driven deficiencies in, de in genome repair proteins, such as the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, which predispose to breast cancer, really the predisposition has to do with lack of repair mechanisms for the genome. And so identifying these patterns has allowed us to see uh, carcinogen exposures. And it's also now uh, being used to try and identify patients for immune and chemotherapy. And so that's been, a, I think, a second big development from, from sequencing. This is still, still a very much an active area. The third area, and this is the thing I really want to talk about this evening, is the dynamics of cancer. And uh, you know, our foray into this, it's been known for many, many decades that cancers are not static over time. They, they change. And that's a, it's a quintessential feature of the disease, which I'm going to come on to in a moment. Our foray into this really started uh, almost exactly 10 years ago when we, um, <clears throat> we published this paper, uh, which I think I think was the first sort of next generation sequencing era um, study of evolution. I think it was also the first solid cancer genome to be really um, described. And we compared at that time, it's now seems laughable, the amount of data we had and the cost and the effort now seems kind of crazy. But um, we compared a primary cancer with a metastatic cancer that arose in the same patient nine years later and were able to show that if you look in diploid regions of the genome, that you can use the presence of mutations to infer that there were clones and that the clonal composition had changed over time. That seems kind of impossibly simple now, but uh, there have been many, many studies in the field using methods like this and others that have revealed all of the features of how cancers change over time and how they change over space. And that's a, it's a fundamental issue in cancer biology. This, ha this does have a translational impact in the form of identifying drug resistance mechanisms and also thinking about rational combinations of treatment. So that, this is kind of what I'm going to spend my time on. What do we mean that cancers change over time? The, the cartoon at the top is meant to illustrate uh, in a cartoony kind of infographic -y kind of way that uh, the cell composition of a tumor, this, is a, this little ball is meant to be a representation of a tumor. If you were to look at the malignant cells in the tumor and ask about their genomic composition, their genetic status, you would find that in many cancers, uh, not all the cells have the same genome. That is to say, the, their, their variants of each other. 
and that over time if the patient who presents at diagnosis may have a tumor that has a certain makeup and then um, of course initial treatments are all directed towards trying to eradicate the cancer but if the treatment uh, if some of the cells escape for whatever reason then in the post-treatment situation the composition of cells will have changed so you won't the same cell populations won't be there but there'll be new cell populations or possibly different proportions and if that cancer spreads somewhere else there will be yet even different populations so the cell populations are dynamical over time and they're responsive to different environmental selective pressures that come from stroma from drugs from other interventions this is a fundamental problem in cancer every oncologist knows that their patients if they don't if they aren't successfully treated at the first round their, their cancers are likely to go through this kind of evolution so it's a basic biological property of cancer and it gives rise to some very important questions that is what the lab this is what the lab is really trying to address which is what are these cell populations how would we identify them if we can identify them can we explain what the molecular basis of fitness is I haven't defined for you what I mean by fitness but loosely it's the idea that some cells may have more, survive more or divide more or simply have better growth properties can we predict the future trajectories of these populations in other words by making measurements or understanding the molecular basis could we say how a cancer might change over time and of course we'd like to know how to avoid or defeat this kind of evolutionary capacity and this problem is not unique to cancer it's a it's a common problem in microbial uh, antibiotic resistance uh, viral resistance to antiviral agents uh, all has the same kind of underpinnings uh, we're studying the same problem just in different genetic systems and so what I thought I would um, try and talk about tonight is this question of how do we define and identify the cell populations because that's a very basic problem we're thinking about so the introduction to this part is if we're thinking about these cell populations are going to behave in different ways it's worth asking uh, if we're, we're interested in why certain cells survive what's the dynamical behavior where does the vectorial information come from or how is it encoded well of course there may be mutations or variation in the genome there's also of course um, cell to cell variation in gene expression and protein expression that occurs as a, in the context of um, space or timing or developmental process that may not be uh, fixed by a genomic variation but may come as the result of an epigenetic state which programs uh, the memory of transcription and this is kind of fundamentally important probably to environmental selection it's still quite hard for us to measure certainly at the single cell level and then of course cells interact with each other so there's neighborhood information spatial context matters in tumors there are vessels immune cells uh, stromal cells all of these interact with cells that have transformed their genomes in order to give rise to the growth properties of, of cancers and so we need a way a kind of a conceptual basis for thinking about cell populations and how we might actually consider parsing them out what does it mean that something is a cell type uh, how would we relate one cell to another and um, I'd like here I'd like to sort of summarize I think two ways in which the field is beginning to, has been thinking about this because it can be a little confusing to people who are coming to the cancer field the first idea is uh, kind of shown in this diagram on the left and the idea here is that in cancer there are two fundamental processes which might be used to relate cells and that is that we have cell division and we also have mutation and uh, if you just translate that into mathematics that's really a branching process so if you have a branching process you can have a hierarchy and therefore you could in principle relate cells in a hierarchical way by saying what are the shared common heritable genotypes if we can identify unique heritable markers that go from cell to cell and then as new markers appear we can define subpopulations that arise that's the basic idea and cell biologists and cancer biologists talk about these things as clones if you hear the word clone that's really what people mean and the basis of being able to do this is to first of all be able to detect mutations or in whatever form be they point mutations or structural alterations of the genome and then measure their inheritance over time or space using different methods and then um, 
use methods of phylogenetic reconstruction and other techniques that are used for looking at hierarchical relationships to infer what the order of mutations may be. And so if you can do this, then you can define, this is a way of defining populations in the, um, in the tumor. There's a related but subtly different concept, which is that, of course, cells may get may exhibit different phenotypes, they may get selected for, they may survive in different ways based not on a necessarily heritable uh, mark, but that you may have kind of unstable or transient gene expression or protein states, which if you persistently select them, will lead to the amplification of cells that stochastically or otherwise get into those protein states. And that will, that will lead to, shown in blue on the right, the same idea that over time the prevalence of, that, of a population of cells may increase. So here you don't really have a heritable mark, but it's more like you're looking at the change in temporal order or the inheritance of uh, expression states. It leads to the idea that there's a kind of a lineage or a manifold over which you have these. And over time, these transient states can get locked into cells through epigenetic mechanisms. So cells acquire a memory of what, what, what was happening, and that, leads to that can lead to drug resistance, for example. The idea of stable epigenotypes. Now, this field has some history. Uh, it turns out that these ideas about uh, mutation, division, the way we might relate division mutation to lineages uh, goes all the way back into population genetics that was around at the turn of the century. And two uh, giants of um, statistics who were around in the 1920s and 1930s that some of you may have come across if you've studied um, these types of statistical models were uh, Saul Wright and Ronald Fisher, who did many other things for statistics, but um, they were interested in the way that um, populations and traits could be mapped, and so they developed a lot of statistical theory, and from this came the idea that the fitness of populations or phenotypes could perhaps be mapped uh, in a dimensionally reduced way into a landscape. This is actually now the subject of a lot of debate whether the idea of fitness landscapes is useful or not. But fundamentally what they were, what these techniques can be applied to is the idea that if you have a branching process, you can, you can try and look at the evolution of populations using these, these approaches. And there are, in fact, many, many modern extensions of this theory that arise from population genetics and branching processes, things like um, Kingman coalescence, which are dual to Wright-Fisher processes, um, Moran models, which deal with overlapping populations, Galton-Watson processes, which deal with extinction. There's a whole range of these. What they require, if you're going to study cell populations in this way, or populations in general, is that you have a way of measuring genotypes that you can infer lineage order and that can natively handle, uh, the, these models can sort of natively handle things like cell division, death, or variable population sizes. And they give you a way because there's an underlying sort of generative process of inferring what neutrality or randomness looks like. And in some cases, you can also infer how alleles might interact with each other. So the idea that genes might interfere with each other in the kind of phenotype that they have. The issue is that the heritable markers that you use to define populations might not necessarily be very closely linked to the molecular encoding of a fitness state. So as a molecular biologist, you're very interested in what's the molecular mechanism that gives rise to my cancer cell surviving. But if you're studying cell populations using just purely heritable markers, if you see a repeated trajectory, you might, you might infer that those markers are somehow conveying fitness, but the linkage might be quite loose and hard to establish. And I think um, we, um, one requires a lot of multi-time or multi-space sampling to get accurate measurements. We have a, the, I think there's another limitation here, which is that we, and I mentioned this in the session that we had uh, just earlier, which is that we have a pretty good idea of what the, the generative mechanism is for single base variants, but it's quite hard to know exactly what that is for other forms of genome structure, and that's actually a research problem. Um, the related area that I refer to, so the thing on the right about expression comes from a different direction, and this was another guy who I think was a genius, really. He, if you haven't come across him, this was Waddington. Waddington was a theoretical biologist who I think was quite influenced by Wright and Fisher and others because he sort of borrowed some of these ideas of landscapes and topologies. And he was essentially a developmental biologist who was trying to think about theoretically how you would 
how could you understand how networks of genes might interact in order to give rise to phenotypes in development? He was interested in how embryos become, go from a single cell to becoming progressively more complex and differentiated. And he had this, these very sort of prescient earlier ideas that this was a very high dimensional space that would not be comprehensible by mere mortals and humans. And so he was really suggesting that we would need dimensional reduction techniques. He had this idea of transforming a phase space down into a much simpler two dimensional or low dimensional space in order to be able to understand how genes interact with each other. And sort of, this is like kind of 50 years before people are now really applying these techniques at scale. And then he came upon this idea that, uh, which is much talked about, that the way in which genes interact and the, uh, the sort of, this could be visualized or thought of as a, as a landscape where the cell or the embryo starts out in a very simple undifferentiated state and then as development proceeds and the interactions between genes become more and more determinative of phenotype that the states into which a cell can fall become progressively more constrained and canalized. And this was a way of thinking about um, the way that gene expression could be used to explain phenotypes and it led to this idea of the cybernetics of development. So there's a lot of history to the, to the field. There's modern extensions of this now that we can measure things in single cells. We can get transcriptomes out of individual cells, move into things like the ability to infer developmental lineages as a pseudotime series. There are, there's been lots of statistical development of that. Um, lots and lots of methods. Um, we actually very fortunate to have recently recruited here to UBC Jeff Schiebinger who works on optimal transport maps. And um, Jeff published a very important paper um, actually earlier this year on the use of optimal transport maps for um, inferring and predicting uh, cell states from, from RNA. Um, the inference of gene-gene gene interactions and regulatory networks is also part of, the, um, part of the new armamentarium. So this is all highly applicable to measurements of RNA and protein states. And there are certainly newer methods which can kind of natively handle translating these states into, into molecular phenotypes, which is a major attraction if you're a biologist studying population lineages a la Wright Fisher can be a bit distant. This gives you may, maybe more of an immediate translation into biology, but there are some limitations. These uh, approaches don't, for example, natively handle the idea of cell division and cell migration. There are a number of statistical fudges that one has to put into these models to account for that. It's also kind of currently unclear that any of these methods can really predict future novel states that have never been observed before. I think that's like a goal of this kind of biology would be to do that. Um, the incorporation of ideas such as transcriptional velocity, which is something that I think has emerged recently from Peter Karshenko and uh, Sten Linus and others, the idea that you might be able to use intron information to uh, give some idea about the directionality of transcription might be important, but this may only work for sort of a few minutes to hours ahead and making stable predictions over days or weeks, I think is gonna need other measurements. So where does this, this is kind of a long introduction to the background to the field, but I think it's kind of hard to understand what we're doing unless you have this context. Um, so we have this two solitudes way of looking at the world. For anybody who's interested in modeling problems, we do not yet have a, a framework for really um, holistically dealing with these different approaches to finding cell populations and looking at the dynamics. And we don't really, there's no concise answer to the question of how many measurements should we make. Uh, some of them we can't really even make proper, properly. So just to, that's a background. Word on the measurements. You can imagine why this is naturally a field that is becoming about single cell biology. Most of what we've learned up to ca about cancer, I would say up to uh, I'm going to say about five years ago, four years ago, it was learned by taking tissues and putting them into a blender and destroying all of the cellular context information. And of course it matters that cells are related to each other in space, but even before you get there, just recognizing that there are different populations, if you simply blend those out, it's quite hard to learn very much about the populations, although we and others have um, developed approaches for clustering, um, mutations that are in subpopulations that allows you to reverse some information out uh, if you have spatial measurements. This whole field is growing in the measurement space. We have recently described a way of sequencing single genomes, which I'm going to describe in a moment, which allows us to look at lineages in a single cell way. 
Um, of course, single cell RNA-seq is now almost ubiquitous. Um, the epigenetic space is getting better, but still a bit weak, and protein states are, are tricky uh, because there's a basic physics measurement problem, but it, at least in multiplexing antibodies in single cells is possible. So there are lots of ways of measuring dissociated single cells. We are now part of a technology development consortium, CR, CRUK MXT program, which is taking uh, methodologies from different centers around the world and trying to make uh, spatial uh, information reconstruction of, of uh, the genomes and transcriptomes of single cells in space um, in three dimensions in tissues, uh, a realistic possibility. In that, but that's still very much a tech D um, exercise on the sort of leading edge of what is possible. But I thought I would do just in a few minutes, and I, I'll, I'll try not to take too long over this because this paper just appeared and so you can sort of read about it, is um, talk about a method that we developed for sequencing single whole genomes. And the idea here is we, we'd like to be able to recover the sequence of individual genomes in the tissue for reasons that I alluded to. There are basically two ways of doing this. You can take the DNA in a single cell. Of course, you have um, two alleles for everything. So that's not a lot to work with in terms of molecular, actual molecules for each state. So you can amplify, and there are lots of methods that have been published for amplifying and then sequencing. Those methods do run into some issues in terms of bias and the inability to natively eliminate duplicates to recognize what is a duplicate in the system does give to a rise to difficulties, particularly in copy number estimation, but also you can end up with polymerase um, in introduced um, sort of mutational processes. We, um, a few years ago, together with Carl Hansen at, um, uh, out at UBC, developed a microfluidic-based method for doing transposition-based sequencing where there's no amplification of the genome. You just use a transposase to go in and tag and then recover that fragment. Uh, this has the advantage that um, you can eliminate uh, PCR duplicates that come in through indexing, uh, but it, the data are sparse, so, but, but even. And so what that lets you do is, um, is pool cells, and I'll explain how we, we do that in a minute. The, the physical, we, what we recently did on the basis of this new paper is that we physically scaled this method using a modified inkjet printer, which is the thing at the top here, and then these uh, patterned microwell, nanowell uh, wafers that come from wafergen, and a lot of fiddling with the molecular biology to make the genome sequencing work in a single pot reaction. Um, this methodology is certainly scalable. We've sequenced over a half a million single whole genomes by now. Um, and in this paper, this recent paper, we, you can, if you go to cellmine.org, you can browse our genomes. We released 52,000 of them as part of a, a data release. Um, and there's a, there's a web-based browser for them there. Um, we collect images of the cells as they go through, and that allow, allowing us to do some machine learning um, investigation of the uh, optical properties and the morphology of these cells in relation to genome states. I'll give you an example in a minute. How do we use this information? So I said earlier that this is shallow sequencing. The way that we prefer to do this is rather than trying to sequence every cell to extinction, which would be incredibly expensive, we would rather take a lot of cells that are shallow, have shallow information and then leverage information from each cell to develop an aggregate. And the way that we do that so we take our tumor population, break it down into single cells, perform the sequencing, get the indexed libraries out, and then for every indexed library, uh, we're able to reconstruct the uh, copy number structural um, aberration structure of the genome at a reasonable sort of re level of resolution. It's kind of bit sequence depth dependent. Uh, and then recognizing cells that have common clonal uh, copy number genotypes, we can take those cells and merge that information in order to get a pseudo bulk representation of each clone. And then at that level, we're able to get single nucleotide uh, resolution coverage of the clones. So what we can reverse out with this method in these structurally unstable cancers is uh, copy number structure to single cell level and single nucleotide variation to clone level, which in this case means about 20 to 40 cells is usually what you need to merge to, to get a decent coverage. And from there, you can do your population reconstruction. When you start to do this, um, shown on this graphic here, when you start to do this in cancers that are unstable, you can suddenly reveal, for those of you who look at this uh, kind of thing, a lot of copy number structure that's hard to, to fathom out otherwise. This is an example of a single clone uh, 
from a landscape of, uh, in this case, ovarian cancer cells that we've, where we determined the clonal structure, and this is one of the clones. And you can just see by looking at the heat map representation of copy number states in the genome that um, we get really quite precise um, the integer copy number becomes resolved in integer states. So you don't have to do a lot of uh, kind of fancy processing to get these integer states out, which is, of course, what you would predict. Any of you used to looking at copy number estimation from whole tumors put in, they, they look much, much noisier than this. And of course, then we can reverse out things that are not easy to find, such as clone-specific clone loss of heterozygosity and other features. And so this allows you to do interesting things. This is an, uh, sort of an application of this where we've taken the ability to merge clones that we can find to the idea of how can we, how can we use this now to look at cancers over time. One of the things we'd like to be able to do is to not to sample very invasively. So when you go and have something taken out, everyone worries about the length of the needle that somebody's going to put in. But it's not the length of the needle that gets you, it's the width of the needle that matters. And so there's a technique called fine needle aspiration where it's possible to get cells out of a tumor using a blood draw needle, essentially the kind of needle you would use for getting a a blood test, but the problem with this approach is that you typically only get uh, you know, a few hundred cells out, sometimes a few thousand, sometimes it's better, but it, it can be just a few hundred cells. And so with a method, with a single cell genome sequencing method, what you can do and what we showed is that with few, here, fewer than 400 cells, you put, every, you put all these cells into the sequencing method. What the heat map shows, every line of this heat map is a single genome, and the heat map colors show the copy number state of each genome. So you can see that in here there's a cancer that has an abnormal amyploid genome, and you can see that there's internal structure, which is the clonal structure of the genome of the tumor. But then, of course, you have these diploid cells at the bottom. These are non-malignant lymphocytes and other things associated. That becomes the reference genome. So from one fine needle aspirate, you can reconstruct the genomics of a, of a tumor from just a few hundred cells. I mentioned earlier the imaging this is an example, a very simple example of taking the images from the camera and trying to make associations between genome states and the images. And here we've simply looked at cell diameter and ploidy, which we can get out of the um, images and asked, is there any association with genome states? And in fact, um, it turns out that genomes that have uh, duplicated their genomes, duplicated or more, to become tetraploid or beyond have a different cell size, nuclear size, shape relationship. So that's an example of how you might start to look at um, multimodal analysis of genomes. Some of the results that drop out from this. So now that we're able to look at cells individually, we're able to start studying processes that are rare among cells in tissues and uh, to also potentially start to look at negative selection. So negative selection means that of course, if you have something that happens to a genome or a cell population, that cell population grows. You don't have any problem observing what that is. It's just present in everything. But if the process leads to something that's deleterious to the cells, it may be recurrently happening. But those cells either arrest or die or otherwise disappear from the population. And those processes are quite hard to study. So one of the things that we noticed early on when we were looking at cell populations is that we, um, in most cell populations, find um, even if they are you know, diploid, well-behaved, non-malignant, non-transformed cells, is that we see cells that have missegregated chromosomes. And that shows up as a whole chromosome gain or a whole chromosome loss. And I've shown some extreme examples of this here. But we can now essentially quantify this, both in cells and tissues. And so you can ask, how does chromosome missegregation at mitosis distribute? And we use this to survey both uh, non-malignant tissues, so cells that are not transformed and haven't become cancers, as well as uh, those that have. And we essentially observe two things. One is that the rate of missegregation is much lower in tissues than in cell lines by a factor of about five. And that if you mutate certain genes, in this case we deleted P53 in an otherwise normal breast epithelial cell line, and what happens is that you shift the pattern of events from predominantly gains to losses. And so this way we begin to learn something about the uh, you know, molecular basis of these early processes. Another example of what you can do with this is to um, 
look at genome replication states. Why can you do this? Um, because here in this copy number representation of individual cells, there are these cells that show up that look uh, in these populations like they're noisy. They've got this funny pattern of what look like micro deletions. These are not, in fact, micro deletions in the true sense. What they are are cells that are in a different state of genome replication because the genome doesn't replicate synchronously but asynchronously. And so using that, it's possible to find a pattern uh, of replication from the representation of reads in early and late replicating regions. And so what that allows us to do is now determine in any tissue that we're looking at is what proportion of cells are in replication and in what state of replication are they. And so now you can take, now you can identify this on a per cell basis. We can take all that information and now put it together and say, if we were to analyze a population and we wanted to know what the evolutionary, the key evolutionary parameters were, we could reverse out uh, both clone uh, mitotic missegregation and S phase fraction. And so that's, there's an example of that shown here where this heat map represents now not single cells but clones in a population where the genotype of every clone is shown in the color heat map. And there's a, there's a bunch of them in here. You'll notice that at the bottom there's a population that is substantially orange. These cells have entirely duplicated their genomes, their tetraploid. And now what we can do is for every one of these clones is we can ask what fraction of the cells in the clone are in an S phase and what fraction of the cells missegregate their chromosomes. And what this reveals is that um, interestingly, perhaps predictably, tetraploid cells missegregate their chromosomes um, more often, but diploid cells have a slightly higher rate, rate of S phase. So these become parameters that you could think about using in a predictive model of evolution. I want to mention one other thing because it led to a nice statistical model uh, that may be of use to people if you're interested in these problems. This was developed by Kieran Campbell when he was working in the group. So he's now got a faculty position in Toronto. And the problem we were setting out to resolve here is so we're making all these genome measurements of cells and we're defining clonal structure based on copy number measurements. We also do a lot of single cell RNA-seq to try and look at the transcriptional states of these individual cells. We would like to have a way of knowing which clones did the transcriptomes come from. So you can solve that problem in copy number unstable cancers using a statistical model under the idea that um, a change in copy number state should lead to a change in gene expression in cis over some number of genes in an interval. And so it's possible to specify a uh, probabilistic model that will take a vector of um, copy number states from single cell DNA seq and a vector of single cell gene expression from single cell um, RNA seq expressions and then assign the RNA seq to a clone. And that turns out to be useful, as shown in this experiment, where here we've taken a population of tumor cells. Um, these were breast cancers. And just for the purposes of the result here, we can break down this population, let's say, into three clones. What we're able to identify is that the cells that belong to clones B and C, defined by copy number states, have a much higher level of HLA class 1 expression than clone A. And it turns out that this clone A is a population that in, in an experimental transplant system in which, um, I'm just showing you a representation of that on the right, this is population prevalences of clones. This is a very dynamically behaving clone but gives you some motivation for saying, for understanding how we would now combine these measurements to look at the features of cell populations. Okay, the very last thing I want to say in the last few minutes now starts to just, how can we start to apply this um, to learn about selection that's happening in this dynamical system? And so the question here is what's the, can we find out what the genomic basis of resistance is to common drugs? So this comes back to uh, Wright and Fisher, the approach that we're taking to this. And it's the idea that if you have a population uh, in which you can observe the trajectories of members of that population, genotypes, and you can repeatedly, and you observe repeated trajectories, that is to say that you see the same populations behaving the same way over time, you can begin to make an association between the genotype that you have that defines the population and the fitness. This is where the idea of fitness comes in. And so there are a number of modern extensions of this idea, which was originally developed to explain um, 
genetic allelic drift uh, in the context of meiosis. Uh, but these models have been developed in a, in a modern context. And so uh, we believe these can be applied now to our cancer situation in instances where there's multiple sampling. And so the way we've arranged to do that is to take patient tumors that we can uh, take out of a patient. They have all of their population structure, all of the cell populations are in there. And then we can take these tumors and transplant them into immunodeficient mice where uh, there's no immune system. So of course it doesn't fully replicate what's in the patient, but what it does do is allow you to study the interaction between different cell populations. And if you take these tumors and grow them, and then as they grow, homogenize them and then retransplant them multiple times, what one observes is that the population structure will change over time in a way that we can now measure with single cell sequencing. And so you can take that serial transplantation idea as an idea of multiple sampling and then layer on top of that the notion that you can put drugs, apply drugs to try and induce resistance and study the resistance problem uh, in this way. And so this is just one example of an experiment in which we've done this. This was a tumor that um, from a human patient, a breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer. These are breast cancers that are particularly aggressive and hard to treat. And in this case, what we did, the tumor was transplanted and we've passaged this tumor over a number of years, serially transplanting it. And then using single cell genome sequencing on the sampled intervals, what we can do is from each single cell is infer its genotype and then learn the um, population structure through uh, phylogenetic inference of the populations. And you can kind of imagine how that might work just looking at this heat map, which kind of shows you a laddered structure um, in the genotypes. Having then identified the population structure, we can map, uh, and that's shown in a little tree here. This is the hierarchical representation of the relationships between these populations. Having then mapped these, we can ask over time, if we've sampled over multiple period, what is the population prevalence of these members? And you can see that's represented here in which um, there's a pink clone here that rises and declines. And then there's a, another clone here that's an orange, which comes up and goes away, and a blue one, which comes up and disappears. And so over a period of time, you see this repeated growth and decline of populations. And then using a, using a modified bright fisher diffusion model, you can take this system and ask what is the what is the calculated fitness of these populations. What's quite striking is that despite all this dynamical behavior, the the numerical differences in fitness, which are represented in this panel here, are actually quite small. That is actually a known um, that's a known result from this type of uh, model behavior. It is possible to have perfectly neutral um, populations with regard to fitness and still have this kind of stochastic selective sweeps that don't actually imply uh, a difference in fitness. But now what happens when you come and put on drugs? And so this, this is the last sort of result I'm, I'm going to show, but this one is worth thinking about. So now we've taken this serially passaged thing and we've done the following thing, which is to take a drug and the drug used here is a thing called platinum. Uh, platinum salts are used to treat patients with breast cancer. And we've exposed the tumor to the drug. And what, no, what happens in the first instance is that this tumor is sensitive to that drug, and so the tumor regresses when you first expose it. But if you take the residual tumor that's been exposed to the drug and retransplant it, and then do that experiment again, and then do it again, eventually what happens is you start to select out resistant populations. And so we can now measure this. And so this is shown here, where we measured this, and here are the phylogenetic trees that show the constituent populations measured in the way that I described. And the, the interesting graphic is here in the center and on the right. So what happened, we can ask now what happened to these populations. And so when we measure the clones, we see that there are, you know, a half a dozen or so or more clones here that have some dynamical behavior as you grow them. And uh, under drug selection, which is shown in the solid lines, there is a clone which emerges, which is related to one of the earlier populations, which we just labeled A for no good reason. Uh, and this clone A star is not exactly A, but it's the closest uh, derivative to A in the phylogenetic tree. So A, A star is actually down here, but A is, is its next door neighbor in the, in the hierarchical relationship. So this is the resistant clone, and it becomes dominant after just a couple of cycles of this chemotherapy. 
Now we can ask another question, which is to say, okay, this clone A star, which is a derivative, is clearly fitter. It's, it's drug resistant. What happens under the case where the drug goes away? And so if we, if we do this experiment, we treat, we treat, we treat, we end up with A star. What happens if you take some of that tumor and instead of continuing treatment, you take the treatment away and then just grow the tumor? What actually happens? And so the answer to that is, um, in fact, sort of, it's a little hard to parse out of this, but I've shown it in the schematic here. And that is that in the first cycle where the ratio of cells is uh, almost 50-50 between, um, between the resistant genotype and the non-resistant genotype, the, non -resistant gen the resistant genotype cells disappear. That is to say, in an absolute sense, when you compare the fitness of growth of these two cell populations, here I have a cell population that's drug resistant, and yet when I don't have the drug, and I just have the founder populations, it's actually less fit. And what that tells us is that there's a fitness cost to having a drug resistant state, a drug resistant genotype. And that seems paradoxical, um, but it obviously that stimulates a lot of thought about what molecular process might be happening. I'm about up on time. I just want to summarize by saying that um, a lot of our work is you know, next generation sequencing analysis. Cancer has told us a lot about cancer biology. And that I think we're now moving into an area where we're starting to apply um, measurement and mathematical methods for looking at cell populations that will fundamentally allow us to understand how drug resistance develops and how we might think about adapting combinations and sort of learning about the, the biology of that. And there's lots of both interesting applied um, computational and statistical problems as well as lots of, I think, quite interesting um, fundamental work to be done in those areas. I will acknowledge all of the funders. We're very lucky here to be supported by the BC Cancer Foundation who uh, generously have supported our work for the last um, 14 years. And we have uh, many talented uh, students and postdocs uh, uh, shown up here. And in relation to the recent paper, they're all uh, nominated here. I, I'm very grateful to my collaborators in statistics and computer science who have been engaged in this and continue to be engaged. I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a tough one to answer because um, it's not, you know, we can't, it's tough to say we're not going to treat your cancer. We just want to see how it changes before we do anything. That's a tough problem to crack, right? Um, it's true that there's no immune system and certainly some of the clonal dynamics that happen in patients are shaped by the fact that there is an immune system. There is, however, a stroma and we do know that there are stromal interactions that matter in terms of the way these cancers develop in the mice. So these tumors develop a vascular system. There are stromal cells that come in and interact with the tumor cells and pattern growth. And we know, we know from having done other experiments where we've put CRISPR-Cas9 guide RNA libraries into these tumors and looked at sort of directed evolution under that system that the stroma matters. So and we, know, and we know from cell biology that the stroma matters. But these are not faithful models of I don't think we can really treat these as kind of this is exactly what the patient would do. But what we can do is treat them as some kind of model of the complexity and try to try to understand that. We're going to have to do other things to learn about the immune system. Uh, I have a question okay. Yeah. Um, is, is this a sensitive platinum? There's different categories of drugs that will target different aspects of the same target group as well. Yeah. Would you, have you, are there any experiments on this right now in that direction? 
all the various types of drugs and how they might impact um, the, the sort of clonal access. Yeah, if I can maybe slightly rephrase that question, I guess there's an important question that we'd like to have the answer to, which is how often do you end up with sort of cross resistance, as it were, between one mechanism and another? So whatever's underpinning platinum resistance in these cells, if we were to bring in a different mechanistic uh, agent, would we see cross resistance or no? And we know in, so in some instances where we've tested this that you don't see cross resistance, like a different mechanism will definitely these cells will be sensitive to something else. Um, and in other circumstances, no. Uh, we actually have a clinical trial that's just completed of a, of a completely new way of targeting genome instability, which, which are, these are drug molecules that stabilize uh, topological structures in DNA that form from G quadruplexes. So guanine bases can stack up in the genome and form stable hairpins. And it turns out that in repair deficient genomes, if you stabilize those things, the cells become very vulnerable to the subsequent DNA breaks. Uh, that, and it's like a completely new mechanism. And, well, G quadruplexes have been known for years, but, but as a drug mechanism, this is a new thing. So we just finished that trial, or the first part of it, anyway. Um, and in this case, you know, one of the application case use cases is actually tumors that have become resistant to platinum. It's a different mechanism. Well, you know, I'm not so sure about that. So I think there's some literature in uh, host pathogen interactions and, and, the, and also in resistance to antimalarials and different, that some, some alleles actually have a significant fitness cost until the environment changes. So that's really what we're, that's really what we're observing here is that under some kind of neutral environment, these cells have a certain fitness whatever that genotype is, it's quite disabling to the cells. And it only has a positive fitness value when, when you come on with the drug. That's the, that's the point, right? And that has been observed before, I think, in, in, in other systems. It's not, not every genotype does that, but in some cases, you know, you get the genotype, it's just positively fit regardless. But in this case, that's, that's kind of what we observed. And there, are, there has been something written about this in the, in the literature, in the, uh, that uh, people have recognized that many of the oncogenes that transform cancer are actually quite disabling to cells in a sense. Like they create a fitness value under a certain environmental situation, but they're actually, when you look at the way that the cells are functioning, they're quite disabled. And the fact that chemotherapy works at all is largely due to that. There's a therapeutic index because although these cells replicate, so they, they've lost controlled over how they divide and when they stop dividing, and they may have differences in cell cell, but actually these cells are quite fragile, and that's to our advantage because otherwise, if you think about it, if we just came along with chemotherapy or radiation, there would be no window in which to give a safe dose, and so that's actually exploited, but it's not that well understood from a from a molecular basis, and I, I think we're beginning to observe this and capture it here in a way that we could study it. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, so this is where the this is where the molecular biology gets tough because now, I mean, the clones that we're resolving here have quite huge genomic spaces. We're talking about copy number changes that may encompass hundreds of genes. So we're going to have to narrow this space down by 
correlating gene expression. So first of all, we can try and ask which genes are actually affected by the genotypes that we associate. That's, I think, one way of looking at the problem. Um, and there is another way that we can address this. And we're, I'm kind of super excited to do these experiments now because we're just getting to a point where the systems are working. And that is we can do another kind of fitness experiment where the interference is with CRISPR guide RNAs. So we can come in and make you know, small deletions in these genes that introduce loss of function or in the modified DCRISPR systems, maybe even do gene activation. And it's conceived, I think we're just about in the space where we can put libraries that are just about big enough into these polyclonal xenografts and then grow them for a period of weeks and measure what the fitness of the guide RNAs was in the population as a way of assessing which of the loci that are involved in the genotype might actually be encoding some of the fitness. And obviously we can play that out, plus and minus drugs. So we're, these are experiments we're trying to do now. Yeah. OK. <laughs> All right, very important. Food is here. No, no, no. So this experiment would be illegal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no. So this isn't a mouse. So what we're doing here is we're taking, although, okay, let me say another thing. So I actually think we have some opportunity to replicate this in a clinical context in the right kind of clinical study. But of course, you, we, can't, we can't do the retransplantation. That's just not, we can't do that. But we can look at what happens to tumors when there are sort of drug interval holidays. That is possible. I think we're just going to start doing that. This is in the mouse. So here you, you've, we've grown this, we've passaged it a number of times in the mouse, and then you start the experiment. And at this passage, we treat. And then we recover what remains of the tumor. We divide it. Some of the tumor goes back into another mouse with no treatment. And then the, the other remainder goes into a mouse, and it gets treatment. And we, we keep replicating that design. That's, that's how that works. Well, we can kind of apply RNA. Um, 